I think a lot of the stuff that I'm attracted to um, is about love. Sometimes I think that every story that I've worked on is in some way just about love and how we conceal it or how we deny it or, you know, that we're all just looking for it in some way. Like all stories seem to be love stories. Hi, this is Andrew Scott here and this is the timeline of my career. Oh, she'd like to sing. You know? Can I turn it off? No, no, no. It helps me to remember. Korea was the first film that I ever did. It was a small Irish movie. I was 17 years old. I was a very, very uh, shy child. I didn't speak a lot. So my mother uh, made the decision to send me to drama classes and I loved them almost immediately. I think it's a bit of a myth about actors that they're very extroverted. I used to go and I was terrified of shaking going into these dra drama classes and then something would happen, kind of come alive in whatever way. So I became sort of, um, it was a lifeline. I wish she was still alive. It didn't make everything so much easier. I worked with an, an Irish actor, a wonderful Irish actor called Donald Donnelly, who was very, very influential on me. He wasn't like the most famous actor. He did some really beautiful movies and some great theater, but he was incredibly kind to people on set and he knew how to sort of lead the company. And so in that sense, I've always remembered that when you're on a set with younger people, it's important to, not to set an example, but that people are certainly watching. You know, if it's their first film, they're working out how to be on a set. So this wonderful man, Donald Donnelly, was a, was a, was a great influence on me. <coughs> Saving Private Ryan uh, was shot in the south of Ireland in 1997. I got cast in this uh, five or six line with this guy who was about to to um, lose his life. It was beautiful. And I was filming a Disney film at the time called Miracle at Midnight. <laughs> Miracle at Midnight. And they wouldn't let me out to be in this Spielberg movie. And I was absolutely devastated that I couldn't uh, do this film. And so they ended up giving me this much, much smaller part where just Tom Hanks basically rolled over me and I had to <laughs> in a completely indistinguishable line that I had. But it was still an extraordinary experience just to be on this extraordinary long stretch of beach. It was beautiful weather at the time. And I remember one point with, with all the other actors who were playing soldiers, a lot of them Irish, and we were like, gosh, it's got really, really overcast. Come on, come on, it was such beautiful weather a second ago. And I always remember that the entire sky, he had covered up with smoke. So this weird, sort of almost like nuclear cloud over the, the set that was stretched along as far as the eye could see. I and mean, it just created this very ominous atmosphere and that really shows in the movie. So you're a radio man. Yes, sir. Well, I was until I lost my radio on the jump. I'm sure I'll get chewed out for that. Well, if you were in my platoon, I'd tell you you were a rifle man first, a radio man second. Well, maybe you could tell that to my platoon leader. I didn't love playing a soldier. I found it difficult to be in Band of Brothers. It's really important to me to have a sense of um, community um, on set. Yeah, there was something about that that I found difficult in relation to, I think, the processes of some of the people involved were different to mine. I didn't think uh, it was necessary to be in character all the time. There was a, an atmosphere that wasn't set up by anyone in particular that was just different to my own. And I think it's always, uh, interesting when you put one of the sexes all together, whether it's all men or all women, it's a very particular atmosphere and, and actually probably very helpful in relation to what it must have been like um, to go through that experience. But yeah, I just guess I'm not really, I'm not really that into um, weapons. <laughs> Jim Moriarty. Hi. Jim? Jim from the hospital? Oh, that really makes such a fleeting impression. But then I suppose that was rather the point. When I auditioned for Sherlock, there were three movies per season, sort of. And in the first season, you kind of got to know these new characters and it was going to be Sherlock Holmes, but set in the modern day. That's what the, the big sort of pitch was. And at the end of the first series, um, Moriarty was sort of supposed to appear as a 
almost like a, a, a visual person and he had to say sort of hello, a couple of lines and then that would be the end of the series. But when they were auditioning the actors, they needed to find out what this actor could do. I remember I had the audition and then the day before, they'd obviously said, oh God, maybe they'd been auditioning actors and there was just actors saying hello, so they couldn't really get a sense. So Stephen, being a brilliant writer, wrote this, what he calls kind of crazy scene. I think what was good about that was that the audience had no familiarity with my face. And I think I was in my early 30s, but I looked um, younger. And um, so one of the sort of things that I had within me was that I wanted to play somebody darker because there's a thing called an actor's imp, a character that you find easy to play even though it's not like who you are. And I think a lot of actors have that. I'm sort of playing somebody dark or having, a, I felt like there was a sort of villain, so to speak, within me because uh, I had this innocent little face. And so I was sort of took pleasure in, in frightening the people in the, <laughs> in the audition. Kill you? Well, no, don't be obvious. I mean, I'm gonna kill you anyway someday. I don't want to rush it, though. I'm saving it up for something special. No, 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 no. If you don't stop prying, I'll burn you. I will burn the heart out of you. I think sometimes what's frightening about people in real life, or why we get scared of people on the street, or we get suspicious of people, is because we don't know about them, actually. It's because we don't know their backstory, because the information we have about people is power and it allows us to go, OK, I, I, I know where the lay of the land is with that person. But actually, if you don't know about that person and there's a sort of mysteriousness to that person, it makes them a little bit more frightening because you don't have that knowledge um, at, at, at hand. A lot of the time I remember asking for my lines to be cut so that I would say less, so that you don't give your power away, so that it's all the more alarming if it just comes out of nowhere. So uh, yeah, sometimes it's about, about doing less rather than getting more. <laughs> I'm in Wales, and I don't have to pretend to be something that I'm not. I'm home, and I'm gay, and I'm Welsh. That's right! <laughs> Pride was an enormously interesting story and it was an extraordinarily beautifully written script. And the character I played in that was a character called Gethin, who was a sort of amalgam of two characters. Sherlock was very big at the time and um, I was kind of, I suppose I was a little concerned that I, I was just now in sort of villain territory and I wanted to be able to um, uh, break out of that a little and Gethin was a very very gentle character and, and he seemed to me incredibly cinematic because he didn't speak very much. The idea was that he was thrown out of his home for being gay and uh, he was silent and I loved that. I loved the idea of a character who doesn't say a lot but you, you have to do a lot of your um, acting with, you just have to feel it really. My mother. Couldn't accept me. Not then, perhaps. She's religious. She hasn't said one word to me in 16 years. And what about you? What words have you said to her? I've always played characters of different sexualities. I don't think you can play a sexuality, and I think what we have to remember is that is to play the attributes of of um, the character, whatever whatever their sexuality may be. Having said that, at the time, it, it was it was important to me to to sort of be out and open and uh, about all that, that kind of things. And it was very um, beautiful in the sense that all the characters in that, the lead characters, there were 15 or so leading characters and they were all gay. So it would be very difficult to just play a trope. Yeah, it was a beautiful, beautiful experience. And one of, one of, um, one of the films that almost 10 years later, people um, are still affected by around the world. So films, movies matter, you know, they really do. So sorry, am I interrupting? Not remotely, 007. I'd like you to meet Max Denby, head of the Joint Security Service. Well, it's a pleasure to finally meet you, 007. I've heard a lot about you. Most of it good. Congratulations on your new appointment. Thank you. I suppose we should call you C now? No, no. Max, please. No, I think I'll call you C. I'd worked with Sam Mendes in the theatre. We did a play on Broadway together with Bill Nye and Julianne Moore, and um, I loved working with them. And so I was thrilled to be asked. I found it difficult to be in that film. I think I could have just been a bit better. I think I allowed myself to be a little intimidated by the budget and the 
history of the franchise. And I don't think I kind of attempted enough to to be original. I think I was just maybe just not very confident. And one thing that I, I, I've definitely learned since then is that it doesn't matter what the, what the budget of a movie is, the same thing matters. It's just simply about really good stories and stuff. And so um, it's just to remember that as an actor, the space between action and cut is exactly the same on in a small budget movie as it is in a huge budget film. So to sort of attempt to still be relaxed and to experiment, I think, and I think to make a mistake and to make a fool of yourself is, is kind of important. We lost an officer and three men two nights ago. They were shot to bits, patching up wire. We dragged two of them back here, nearly bothered. Sir, the general is sure the enemy have withdrawn. There are aerials of the new line that shut up. We fought and died over every inch of this fucking place. Now they suddenly give us miles. It's a trap. I worked with Sam again on 1917. The premise of that is so interesting in the sense that that's one camera, as spectacular as it is. I remember Sam talking about that you could just use your phone to imagine what way the thing is going to work. So you have to pick up that person. If that person is speaking to that person, you have to follow them there. So the, the filmmaking is actually very, very simple. And I love that, even though that what you're taking in is um, enormously complicated, that sort of, for miles behind you there could be extras and everything but the the very simple act of one camera following everything it's a very simple idea and it's a very theatrical idea and that's why Sam was the perfect person to um, direct that movie and I love the idea of playing with the form a little and being experimental even when you've got a lot, a lot of money because audiences adore that and that's who, what, who we're doing it for. Rashford let him look Straight ahead to the left, past the dead horses. There's a gap directly behind them. I think it's a five or six minute scene. And because you're only using it on one camera, using one take, usually in a, in a movie, if you can't get your cigarette lighter working, it doesn't matter. They just do another take or they use, a, they use another angle. But if you've only got one angle, you have to get every element of the, of the scene completely correct. Otherwise you have to start right back from the beginning. So you don't just go, okay, we'll just pick it up from the bit where you didn't get the lighting, we'll cover that and then we'll collate all that, those images and we'll send it to the editor. In this one, you had to get everything right. So it was a walk and talk scene and you're there at the end and there's 200 extras and the light's going, whatever. And you're, if your if you're cigarette lighter doesn't work, you either try and make it work and make it work it into the, into the scene or you fuck it up. And so, um, uh, that's what was sort of extraordinary. And Sam said a really helpful thing. He said, you know, alleviate yourself from the pressure that you're going to get this six minute scene with all these different elements within two or three takes the way you normally would in a regular movie. So it could take 19 takes. I think in the end that he used the 22nd take and we did maybe 32 takes. But that's all the stuff in movie making that I still find it sort of um, enchanting and I like the fact that it's a different way of m um, making movies. Phoebe Waller-Bridge is, as a person, a natural storyteller. When she's telling you a story about something that might have happened to her, she wants to set the scene for you. She's again interested in delighting the audience. There's an idea of the fourth wall being broken and playing with the form of TV, which I found really, really, um, really exciting. And I think a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that I'm attracted to um, is about love. Sometimes I think that every story that I've worked on is in some way just about love and how we conceal it or how we um, deny it or, you know, that we're all just looking for it in, in some way. Like all stories seem to me to be love stories. And she's very interested in, in that, whether it's familial love or self-love or romantic love. Fellow smoker, do you have a spare one? Sure. So do your family get together much or? Well, fuck you then. Certainly got an autograph on her writing and uh, it was extraordinary that that was so um, 
beloved around the world because I think the audience just loved it, kind of the new form of it, coupled with uh, her extraordinary performance and the great cast that she assembled. And again, it was a new um, um, departure for me a little because I hadn't played sort of romantic characters. I think sometimes that's just down to chemistry. It's kind of magical in a sense. I think the um, ability to be able to just look at somebody and for them to look back at you, sometimes I think that's undervalued <laughs> by filmmakers, just to have characters looking at each other. And it was beautifully uh, written, obviously, but it was beautifully edited that. And a lot of the dynamics of their relationship actually, I think sometimes were set up by the silences between them and the looks between them. Um, they counted for a lot. You know, the worst thing is that I fucking love you. <laughs> I love you. It'll pass. I think some of the, the big relationships that we uh, can have in life don't necessarily mean that they have to last a lifetime, but that doesn't make them any less significant. Um, if he did choose Fleabag, how would that end up? And sometimes you just have to make very, very hard decisions out of love, actually. And that's a, it's not something we see a lot in in movies and, and TV, and it almost sort of strengthens the love in a story that's very much about, can be about sex and is seen as sort of naughty. It's actually a very beautiful idea that you love somebody and then you let them go. I think it's happened to a lot of us. <laughs> I think uh, a lot of us go, I love that person, but I know that I can't, um, I can't be with them. It's awful, it's absolutely awful, um, but um, it's true. And that's what we're in the business of representing. <laughs> For once, you might attempt to set a good example to our tenants and to our villagers, to show them what a, what a, what a lady might be, instead of subjecting us to all the shame, humiliation. Well, I'm not a lady, sir. This cannot mimic one. It's amazing. Bella I was 17 when she made the film, and I was 17 when I made my first picture. And, and I think the great challenge as you move forward in your work is to remain interested and to remain open. And I love the idea that any scientific or artistic breakthrough starts with the idea of, I don't know, I don't know. But as you become more distinguished or awarded or respected, there's an assumption that you do know. And so then you're the person that sort of tells everybody the way it is. And so looking at Bella, who is so beautiful in this film, she's so completely free. People sometimes think that acting is a bit of a frivolous thing to do. And, you know, maybe there's an argument for that. But I think there's something very uh, brave, actually, in this person just watching her just completely unafraid to make a fool of herself being brave and being raw and all that kind of stuff. And so I think the challenge in a way is to remain like a child and remain like a five-year-old. I think uh, there could be a danger. The father figure could be a sort of um, one note kind of character that he's sort of macho and he's sort of like just kind of uh, one thing. And actually what I think we attempted to discover was this guy was actually suffering under this system as well, that actually he wasn't, he wasn't a particularly proficient um, sword fighter or he, he's not particularly manly in the way that, that society would kind of um, um, like him to be. Um, and that if you have a society where you repress women, actually in some ways you uh, trap the men too. I think showing that the father is suffering under this system um, sort of supports the central storyline, which is that um, women were so subjugated at the time. All of these great women that I've worked with in the past few years, they all have something in common in the sense that they, of course, are writing feminist, so to speak, um, work, but they're also great humanists. And I think that's the thing that we have to remember that um, most great feminists really love men and want the ma male characters to be flawed and not just evil overlords. You know, they want to be able to understand them, but they just want to understand them from their point of view.
the purpose of what we're doing is to reach out and grab the audience by the hand and say, I empathize with you. That's the purpose of movies or stories uh, is to sort of say you're, you're, you're not alone. And so it takes the actor to be able to go, well, I'll do it. I'll cry. I'll bring myself, I'll bring my, my heartbreak and I'll share it with you. And I hope that it'll make you understand yourself a little bit more. And that, that seems to me to be an honorable thing to do. It's, it makes me want to still do it after all, all this time.